So the last of our undergraduate student presenters this afternoon is Tyson Carter. Tyson Carter is a senior biology major. Uh, Tyson came to the University of Dubuque from the frozen north of Port Elgin, Ontario, and to the land of maple syrup and more maple syrup he'll return, uh, as he was recently accepted to the master's program in biochemistry at McMaster University in Ontario. Uh, the only potential speed bump in the pursuit in that pursuit took place last month as Tyson was invited uh, to the 2014 Regional Canadian Football League Combine. Today, Tyson is going to zoom in a bit farther in the ORCID genome to discuss microRNA and form and function. So please well, join me in welcoming Tyson. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for the introduction, Professor Hoffman. So uh, my research was to find the ORCID floral microRNA profile and their ro role in floral development. So uh, you're going to go through the objectives that I made for my research along with the methods I used to construct my microRNA library and the methods I used for my MIR319 gene expression profile with the results and my conclusions. So I think everybody here is fairly familiar with the uh, genome um, and how it works in cells. Uh, your genome uh, is made of DNA. The DNA encodes for protein and protein makes up the different parts of the cells and the cells make up the different organs and tissues of your body. So there's a really small piece in that whole cog, the whole system there, and it's microRNA. So what exactly is microRNA? Well, it's a small molecule, only about 18 to 22 nucleotides in length. It is transcribed from microRNA genes. It is processed in an extremely complex pathway, and it's just extremely essential. This is what they found in the last couple of years. It's very essential in gene regulation. So microRNA research started in 1993 when this man, Victor Ambrose, he discovered the first microRNA. It continued on, of course, and in 2001, uh, the combination of the Bartle, uh, Tuchel, and Ambrose labs deemed the small RNA microRNA. They gave it the official name. And later on in 2001, David Bartle, he was the first person to isolate a plant microRNA. And last but not least, with their Research starting in 2003 with the eventual um, acceptance of the 2007 Nobel Prize in Medicine. This is Andrew Fire and Craig Mello who uh, discovered RNA interference or exactly how small RNA um, directly works with gene regulation. So why is microRNA important to us? We know that it has a role in reducing cancer cell viability. It's active in many age-related diseases, and it's been proven that the absence is related to many neuro, uh, neurological diseases, especially Parkinson's disease. And more importantly, with this chart I'm pulling up here, we can see as we start with organisms such as E. coli, very, very non-complex organisms, and as we go down the list to Homo sapiens, us, we can see the total percent of cellular uh, protein coding RNA will start up in 84 and drop dive actually down to 2. So 98% of the total RNA in each one of our cells is not even coding for the proteins that, that we make. Pretty cool. So how are they produced? They are transcribed from the microRNA genome inside the nucleus where they encounter the Drosha enzyme which bends it into a hairpin loop. The hairpin loop is what is spat out in the cytoplasm where it encounters the dicer enzyme. The dicer enzyme removes the loop and leaves, with a, leaves you with a double-stranded RNA molecule. The more mature strand of the double strand will go and, and encounter the risk protein complex, and it's that a partnership between the risk protein complex and the microRNA that actually influence gene regulation. And there's two ways which they do this. It'll either bind to messenger RNA and destroy it, completely break it apart. Or as shown on this diagram, it'll instead bind to the um, molecules being uh, tr translated by your ribosome here and act as a roadblock. And it'll halt translation and it will stop proteins from being expressed in cells. So why are we in our lab interested in orchid floral microRNA? And it's these two pictures right here. As my partner in crime, Lauren, was talking about. We have this lip and then this dorsal petal uh, product between the normal and mutant orchid. And what we want to know is, is this microRNA involved in this lip to petal conversion between these two flowers? 
So just to recap a little bit, there is the TCP gene family, and it's one of the most important gene families in floral development, which has two different genes, the cycloidea gene, which is involved in floral symmetry, and the Cincinnati gene, which is uh, involved in petal and leaf development. So what we found is that there's two different uh, floral TCP genes from orchids that have this conserved MIR319 binding domain. And now I'm going to circle them for you here, which shows that there is there you go, activity between the MIR319 gene and these genes in this TCP gene family. So questions we were trying to answer is, what role does MIR319 play in TCP gene regulation? Does it have any relation to floral symmetry? What other microRNAs are found in orchid floral buds? And what genes are they regulating? I don't know if we answered them all, but we hopefully answer a couple. My first objective was construction of a floral microRNA library. And the second was determining the MIR319 profile in normal and pyloric flowers. So to do this, we used a kit uh, called a Mercat cloning kit. And it, this basically describes what we uh, did here. We, we bound a three prime linker to our intended sequence, followed by a five prime linker, where then we would reverse transcribe the RNA into cDNA. We would take the cDNA, amplify it, and then insert it into a vector to be cloned so then we could send that clone for sequencing. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> Wrong. So to separate the small RNA, because there's lots of large, like thousands and thousands of nucleotides of length RNA found in the cell too. So we had to find a means of separating it from the larger lengths. And so we used a urea poly polyacrylamide gel here. And these are the streaks. And you can see this is all larger RNA found in the respective uh, buds we use, which are O minus two and O minus four buds. And this is the small RNA that we, we actually isolated. And you can see that it's at the appropriate length because you can faintly see, I suppose, it's kind of washed out on the screen. But this is our ladder, and there's a 21 nucleotide, 19 nucleotide, and 17 <coughs> nucleotide length ladder. And as you can see, it fits right nicely around the 19, in between 7 and 19, 18 nucleotides in length, which is what we're looking for. So after that, we attached a three prime linker, which the, with the linker and the length of, our sequ of uh, the RNA, I should say, we were looking for about a 40 nucleotide uh, length base or molecule. And as you can see, we got that base off of this being the ladder and around 100 nucleotides in length. After that, we attached the five prime linker and we amplified it. And so this result was actually the O minus two and O minus four. This is our linkered and amplified a uh, small RNA sequence found in these buds, in the flowers. And we, with, all, with both linkers attached, we, uh, it's a pretty approximately 72 base pairs, and this is our 100 base pair ladder, so we're right in that neck of the woods. Followed by that, we were going to digest this sequence, and we use a BAN1 enzyme to make sticky ends, because instead of just inserting the one sequence into a vector and hoping that it cloned, we figured we'd attach a billion, and maybe one of them would get cloned. And that's what uh, was being showed here with this concatenarized sequence. We then, we then uh, used these clones with the concatenarized cDNA, we digested with EcoR1 enzyme, just to check to make sure that we had something inside the vector. And as you can see, these results here prove that we did have small cDNA inserts inside each vector that we sent to be cloned. So after that, we sent out to be cloned at a cloning, uh, sorry, sequenced at a sequencing facility, and I got this back. <laughs> I had to deal with that. So what that is, is that's the sequence with the vector and the connectors, and then our coveted microRNA sequences. And so what I went, I went in, and I had to ice, I defined all these microRNA sequences, and so just from one example, from one of the buds we used, this is how many microRNA sequences that came out, sorry, that from that one large sequence once I removed the connectors and the vectors. So that was the construction of our floral microRNA library. The second part was determining the expression profile for the MIR319 gene with the normal dendrobium and pyloric flowers, pyloric mutants, I should say. So to do this, 
we, we extracted the small RNA using tri-reagent and precipitated it with sodium chloride PEG solution. We then used a stem loop primer that was specific for the MIR319 gene to synthesize the cDNA. And what the stem loop primer is, is it's just a, a bunch of nucleotides that are specific for each other that when they bind, they form this loop. And as you can see right here, form a little area for the microRNA to bind onto and then to bind your, um, your enzyme so you can create this uh, complementary strand. We then use the MIR319 forward primer and a universal reverse primer to amplify the cDNA to create more of it. So what we got after that whole process is this, this is the by concentration based off of the intensity of the tint is how much of MIR319 is present in each of the respective floral organs. And as uh, my partner Lauren showed uh, earlier with the TCP gene, you can see that compared when you have plenty of MIR319 in the lateral and ventral sepal, you see very, very little or no, or no TCP gene. Whereas in the lip and petal with significantly less MIR319 present, you see much more TCP gene being expressed. So a little bit of a connection there. So then we uh, did the same process for the mutant flower, the pyloric flower, and these are the results we got. So just to show a little bit of comparison of what the connections we were making is here is the normal flower right here and here is the mutant. The lip and the petal of the normal and the sepals for the normal. A little bit of difference perhaps, but definitely for the mutant flower, which has a dorsal and lateral petal with the absence of the lip and, and sepals, we find zero dif difference in concentration of MIR319 between all the organs. So the conclusions that I've made, we successfully, successfully constructed a orchid floral microRNA library. Our research shows that there are floral uh, microRNA families that are present including the MIR319 gene family. And we also found many new small RNA sequences that have not been reported yet. Uh, even more importantly, in my opinion, is this MIR319 expression between the normal orchid and the mutant, that we can see that difference between the organs. And how this high MIR319 expression is correlating with the low TCP uh, miRNA levels. I'd like to sincerely thank the Calapides for providing me this awesome opportunity and the Iowa Academy of Science. And I would also really like to thank Dr. M. Um, the time and passion that she puts into this work, it, it makes it pretty easy to be passionate yourself. And then also Lauren Smith and the rest of the Dubuque Science faculty for teaching me all you know. <laughs> Thanks a lot.